the book of 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. You know the story that we've been uh, dwelling on, the great lady named Hannah, the lady that um, lived in impossible situations. She was barren, and she was a uh, favorite wife, and yet uh, the wife that uh, had no children. She was a persecuted wife. And we see the cultural situation that she was in. We see a, a husband that, uh, although following God in many ways, he also was consumed by the bad culture that they lived in as far as bigamy and polygamy were concerned. And so we see that um, uh, she was a victim of her culture. She was a victim of uh, so many things. And yet we see that she had such a strong faith in the Lord. She was a victim of the religion of the time. Her, she went to pray at the most holy place in Israel. And even the priest, the high priest, didn't understand her. Thought that the, the, um, it was in the day, times of the judges where every man was doing what it was right in his own eyes. And as a result, there wasn't a whole lot of spiritual inclination. And when, of course, Eli saw her praying, Remember, he thought she was drunk. How sad that must have been. What an insult or what a hurt that must have been to her at that time. And yet we see that God marvelously gave her a child. After she had prayed and said, Oh, Lord, if you will give me a child, I will lend him to you. I will give him to you. And he'll be a Nazarite all of his life. And, uh, of course, dedicating him as, as uh, Elkanah and Hannah were Levites and part of the priestly line we know that um, Samuel, or Samuel would become a priest uh, for the Lord. He would have the priest's office. And so God blessed there. But now Hannah, as she is praying, and this is one of the great prayers of the Bible, uh, we call it a prayer, with a, a prayer and a song. It's a song of possibly the setting was whenever, and someone said it, the the um, song composed in the womb. In other words, she was, she was probably carrying this baby when she realized she was going to have it. And this wasn't just a psalm that she just, sort of the spur of the moment, wrote down and, uh, and said, but probably at one of those uh, next baby dedications or the dedication whenever she was taking that child to the, um, to the uh, tabernacle and uh, dedicating him as a priest to the Lord, we see that uh, she has something prepared. And uh, she's a woman that knows a great deal about the Bible. She knows a, lot, a great deal about her Lord. And uh, we see that uh, God greatly blessed her and gave her such a tremendous um, station in Israel at the time and even to this day. And so we see that uh, in chapter 2, verse 1, and the Bible says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Take no more or talk no more uh, so proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is your God, is the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full of, have hired for themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. The Lord, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among the princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. 
from heaven, he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, Father, we pray that you will bless the reading and the preaching of your word tonight. Lord, that we thank you for this great lady that is such an inspiration to us today. That how we pray, Father, that uh, we will learn to praise you like she did, that we would have uh, a, a vision of you and an awareness of you like she did. We thank you, Lord, for what uh, testimony she is and what a blessing it is to see that, Lord, you work in the hearts of people like, uh, like Hannah. And, Lord, we, we pray. We want to see that here. We want to see people come to know you. The ungodly become godly. The sinner become a saint. The child of Satan becoming a child of God. Turning from darkness to light and uh, glorifying you in the process. Oh, Lord, we pray your blessings upon us as we look into your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Hannah, of course, we see that uh, she's speaking from the voice of experience. And we see three different uh, sections here. We see her exaltation, which is the idea of exuberant praise. And then we see her exhortation to the people. And then we're going to see also uh, the exaltation of our Lord. And so uh, we'll see that as she looks back as well as forward to what God is going to do. And one of the great things we see is that H Hannah is given uh, in this prayer, she is, this is the first mention of the Messiah as far as the king and Messiah in the Bible. And it comes from a woman. Well, after all, the Messiah was born to a woman. It's interesting how that God just kept showing us the importance of women uh, in the Bible. Although there's so many things about the men, we see that underlying all that, God has never forgotten the woman. And we see that uh, Hannah now, and we have to realize in poetry, we think of rhyme and meter and so forth, the verse, um, and we want, to, we want it to be a, a certain timing, and we want it to, the words to match and so forth. Well, we call, they call uh, Hebrew writing, it's a parallelism of thought. They, they will say things differently and meaning the same thing. So it's more of a, of a rhyme of thought than it is of words. And so we see that, especially in the first uh, two verses, as uh, notice Hannah, as she says, my heart rejoices. And uh, she is rejoicing in the Lord, Jehovah. And also, my horn. Now that word horn it is the idea of strength. Um, even, Dan, uh, even David used it later on when he said, the horn of my salvation. Of course, the strength of my salvation. It comes from the idea of, um, of, of, of course, a, a bull or whatever, something that is very strong as an ox or whatever, and the horn would represent that. And, of David, and David even said that in uh, Samuel chapter, for Samuel chapter two, uh, 22, verse 3. So he uses that term, and we saw it used, and we'll see it used uh, repeatedly in the book of Psalms, the horn, and the idea of the strength that uh, a person has. And so we see that uh, she says, my heart and my horn, the strength of my salvation, he's, uh, uh, my horn is exalted, my strength is exalted in the Lord, and uh, my mouth, or my smile. Uh, he says, my smile, I smile at my enemies. Why? Because something's inside, and I can smile at Satan's rage and face a frowning world, as we would sing. But uh, I can smile and I rejoice. And now we get the setting, she's probably praying this and praising, maybe she's singing it. Some people call it Hannah's song, and uh, then we see, of course, she did pray it, but did she sing it? And so uh, uh, we would see that this would possibly be in the court of women, or it may have been with, uh, with the whole, the family gathered around, realizing now that this baby is going to be dedicated to the Lord for the rest of his life. And so she's Praising the Lord in my, my heart, my horn, my, my strength, my mouth, everything about me. I'm exalted. I'm, I'm triumphant in what God has done. And look what God has done in my life. The impossible became the possible. And here right before you is this baby. And you, she might be even holding it in her hand. 
uh, holding the, well, that wouldn't be because he's actually now, if this is at the uh, dedication, he'd be about three to five years old. And so uh, this kid would be right there with her. And so uh, we see that she's exulting, she's, ex she's exuberant in her praise to the Lord. But then we see that uh, my God is, okay, what is her God? Her God is holy, he's unique, and he's strong. Because notice she says that, uh, not in verse 2, uh, no one is holy like the Lord. He's holy. And, uh, well, of course, we see that uh, the first thing that, uh, that Isaiah saw when he saw the Lord, high and lifted up. And the angels were saying, holy, holy, holy. And so we see that his glory filled the temple, or his train filled the temple. And so we see there's none, uh, there's none like him. He's unique. And Isaiah said that, I am the Lord thy God. There is no other. And so, and of course, we know that he's unique in salvation. There's no other name given among men, whereby men must be saved. And that's the, that's the name of our Lord. And so we see that uh, God was unique. And this is something that a godly Jew realized. Hey, we, we don't compare our God with other gods. Uh, the other gods around us and so forth. But God of, the God of heaven is superior to any other god. And of course, that's what always got other people mad with them, and even today. There's no way, folks, there's no one who can compare with Jesus Christ. There's no one that could save anyone outside of Jesus Christ. Now, we know that, and it's very easy to say that in this setting, but uh, you get into a bigger setting, and you will have people that say, wait a minute, you think that you're the, the only way to heaven. No, not, I'm not the only way to heaven. Jesus is. And so uh, one of the things that disappointed me at the convention that was last week was they had a good prayer at the end of it. Uh, they had a Christian praying. But then they had some p person got up and she wrapped uh, her sari around her head or whatever they call it. And she went off into to a, one of these, uh, maybe it was a, something that uh, maybe ha Hannah did, but it, of course, in, as far as the... Uh, the venue anyway where she sang a prayer but it was but you couldn't even understand it it was uh, but uh, she wasn't praying to the god of heaven uh but there again we're a free country and they're trying to be a big tent and all that so i don't I, I, but i grit my teeth i do praise the lord that franklin uh graham got up and did pray to the lord jesus christ and so forth but uh uh those are things that uh you know, we grit our teeth about being in a free country. We can't stop it. It's freedom of religion. But as a Christian, we know that there's only one way, and that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so she's praying. He's unique. He's the only way. And so there's none, there's none like him. And then, nor is there any rock like our God. He is strong. So he's uniquely strong. And, of course, that rock, we can look back and uh, this would come from Moses, the Song of Moses. Moses called uh, the Lord the rock several times. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, the Song of Moses, his farewell song as he's, he's praying to, for the people and he's telling them, he, he says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth. And so we see that that uh, idea of the rock, he's the rock of our salvation. Um, David, at the end of his life, in his farewell song, he says in 2 Samuel chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me, and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, uh, the rock of, is the rock of Israel. He who rules over men must be just. And so, yes, he rules over men, and he's just. He's the rock of Israel. And so we see that David used that term. And then you think of Paul. Paul later on talked to, to the uh, Corinthians. And uh, chapter 10, verse 4, 1 Corinthians, he said, of course, talking about the water from the rock. And he said that, uh, that they drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. And, of course, you think about streams of living water flowing from the rock. And a lot of people, when we think of a little old rock that was out there that Moses struck or spoke to or whatever, supposed to speak to, but he struck it both times. But, 
But to feed 2 million people that are thirsty, you've got to have a pretty big stream of water. So it wasn't just a little trickle. But here the Lord uh, equated that blessing. And this is what followed them. The spiritual rock, in other words, the rock was God, not some rock that they drug behind them. But that rock was Jesus Christ and how that he was watching. He went before them and he was behind them, but he gave them the water of life. And so we see that uh, God is the rock and we see that throughout the Bible. He's our stability. I like what uh, David said back in Psalm 40, one of my favorite verses. Um, he had brought me out of a horrible pit and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. So the idea of God being the rock or setting our feet upon the rock, which would be himself, we see that image throughout the Bible. And so we see that Anna, Hannah, I'm sorry again, <laughs> but Hannah um, was exalting in what, who, what God had done for her. She rejoices in who God is. And she's really just exulting or exalting and that triumphant praise of what God has done. And the, the manifest answer to prayer was right there before, that little boy that is now being dedicated to the Lord. And then we see her exhortation as she talks to others, and she's going to explain a lot of things about the Lord as we see uh, the, now in the parallelism before we get through. Notice how that they, it's not parallel even in English, and of course, even or even in Hebrew, it's not the idea of the words rhyming as it is saying the same thing several different th ways. And so we see, we call that parallelism. You know, my heart rejoices. Um, my, I smile at my enemies. I rejoice, rejoice, smile, re rejoice. And then we see also, my God, there's none holy like him. There's none other. He is, uh, uh, nor is there any rock. So notice how that he just keeps, she keeps saying the same thing in different ways. And they call that parallelism, a parallelism, parallelism of thought and not of words. And we think of, uh, uh, now I lay me down to sleep and I pray my soul to keep. Um, well, that's our rhyme, but uh, a Jew wouldn't do that. They would just say it a different way. Uh, I lay my da myself down to sleep or whatever. And then they would say that, a different way. But uh, so we see that uh, now she's going to go and she's going to talk and she's, uh, she's going to exalt, exalt the people or exhort the people. And uh, she talks first of all to the proud. And you can imagine now Penina is there and all of her kids. And um, then there's a lot of other women that were probably around that kind of thought of Hannah as not being blessed of the Lord because she didn't have kids. But we see that uh, this is one of those times where she can say, you know, my God is good. And yes, he did bless me. And there's a little bit of pride in there, but I don't think that, uh, as some people think, she wasn't looking at Penina and saying, told you. You know, she wasn't being mean here. She was just exalting in the Lord. And Penina got the message. And I'm sure that Hannah was the type of godly woman who wouldn't rub it in but just uh, remind people that God is good. And so we see that in verse 3, uh, talk no more uh, so proudly. Uh, for, uh, let no arrogance, notice that parallelism, uh, first of all, don't, don't talk so proudly, and then arrogance. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So God has vindicated me. God has done his work, and also he will judge me, and he'll judge you. And so let's make sure that we're all right with the Lord. But now she's going to go into um, seven different, and of course, no, seven is the, um, the uh, number of completion, and, some, and also the number of perfection. But uh, she's going to go into several contrasting parallelisms here. She's going to talk about uh, uh, she's going to use the same thought, but she's going to turn it around and one, she'll say one thing one way and then turn it around and say the opposite in the same parallel passage. What, we'll see that in a moment. But we see there's seven of them. The bows of the mighty men are broken and those who, humble, those who stumbled are girded with strength. 
So we're going to see that the, the, he made the strong weak and the weak strong. You know, the bows, the, the, of course, that's an idea of military might, of, um, of armor, and, of course, of weaponry. But the bows of the mighty men are broken. But uh, those who stumbled are girded with strength. And so the mighty are made weak, and the weak are made mighty. The strong are made right. And then we see the full and the hungry. In verse 5, he says, Those who were full have been, hired themselves out for bread. In other words, they were full, but now they're having to go out and, and work like crazy just to eat. And the hungry have ceased to hunger. So there are those who hired themselves out to bread. At one time, they were full. But now they're hungry. And then there are those who are hungry that now are full. And uh, uh, even the barren, and so this is the third. And boy, this is where she really gets to it. The barren has borne seven. Now, she doesn't have seven kids yet. In fact, she'll never get to seven. It'll only be six. But but there again, that word seven is uh, to the Jew was the number of completion. And it it meant many. It didn't necessarily mean seven all the time, but it did mean that uh, God gives you what you need and uh, you're going to be complete in him. But uh, the barren has borne seven. And she who had many, and that would be the word seven also, uh, children have become feeble. Now, I don't think that uh, he's, she's wishing Penina to be feeble, but uh, she's, uh, she's saying that you're not as strong as you thought you were. But uh, at the same time, uh, She's just saying, this is what God does. He raises up one and casts down another. We see that in, uh, in David says that, over in Psalm 75. So we see that uh, you have the strong becoming weak, the weak becoming strong, the full becoming hungry, the hung- hungry becoming full, the barren now having completion, and the woman who has many all of a sudden is feeble. Then we see the dead and the alive, because he said, uh, in verse um, verse 6, he says, The Lord kills and makes a life. He brings down uh, to the grave and brings up. And so he said that two different ways, and that parallels in verse uh, 6. So he kills one, makes a life. And then he brings down one down to the grave, and he raises others up. And so we see from barren to fertile, from uh, dead to alive, from sick to well. Notice he says he makes the poor uh, uh, and he makes rich. And he brings low and lifts up. So we have uh, poor, to, poor and the rich. Um, he, he, the, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. So notice that parallelism again. Then uh, to set them among the princes and to keep them or to make them inherit the throne of glory. So notice uh, she is saying all this as far as parallelism is concerned and that uh, God does raise up one and cast down another. We, we say things like, uh, and we read verses like, uh, the horse is prepared for battle, but safety comes from the Lord. Everything about us, really, uh, we want to ask God to bless. Lord, I want uh, to be successful. Well, God is the one in the end who makes us successful. He's the one who brings the bright people into our life at the right time. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just go around and say, Lord, uh, I can't do anything. Make me successful. No, he said, well, I realize, Lord, that when I set out tomorrow and my quest for a paycheck for this coming week, you're the one who's got to supply. So everything comes from you. Now, in sales, you do that a lot more than people on wage an hour. But at the same time, you realize that certain things have to come together. We've talked about that. In order to be able to sell something, you have to have a product. You have to have somebody who needs that product. You have to have people who can buy it. You know, all the different things that work together. You have to have materials to make it. All the hundreds of things that come together in order for you to sell an ink pen. Someone has said that there's 100 people that, or over 100 people, that for that little old common ink pen for it to be in your hand, there has to be about 100 people that things pass through. I mean, you think about the steel that's on the, the head. You think about the ink that has to be made. You think about the plastic and the plastic molders that have to make the plastic and all the different things just for you to have that ink pen. And any of them that you didn't have, you wouldn't have an ink pen. 
And so it's interesting how that, and we're finding that out in our country today. We talk about supply chain. A supply chain depends on many links. And well, you break one of those links and you've got a problem. And so we see that everything depends on God. Everything. Then now we go and we're going to try to do what God tells us to do because our times are in his hands. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He does all that, but we have to be in his will doing what he wants. And even if we do get what we want as far as the ink pen, if we get it illegitimately or in, in, outside of God's will, we're not going to be happy anyway. We're, no, we're not going to be fulfilled in life until we realize who God is and what he's doing in our lives. And so we see that, uh, that God has done all this, and he's raised up one, and he's cast down another. He's brought it all together. He's made the poor rich and the rich poor. And so God does those things. And we could go into illustrations about... Uh, People who had everything. I, I, one of the saddest things to read is sometimes you'll read about the Hall of Fame football player, baseball player, and they were making millions of dollars, and now they're broke. And all the different things that happened. Or the person who's rags the riches, the Horatio Alger type of guy who is on the sidewalk, and all of a sudden things fall together for him, the American dream and all that. And so we see that in the end, it's God who allows that. And so... Uh, and she is realizing that. And she's saying, it wasn't me, but this is what God can do. But then when, in the last part, we see that uh, she exalts the Lord. She, exalt, she was exalting. That's the idea of, uh, of triumph, praise. But now she exalts the Lord in the last passage. For the pillars of the earth, in verse uh, in the verse 9, or the last part of verse 8 and, and into verse 9, he says, For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Every, almost every book in the Bible, in fact, I've never traced it all the way through, but uh, so many, hundreds, thousands of references to creation are in the Bible. And so, and of course, in the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. There was no evolution. And uh, we know that uh, if there was an ev evolution, and I don't want to get off into that subject tonight, but uh, if there is evolution, then you'd have to do away with Romans chapter 5. Because as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. Well, you mess up everything if you don't know where, where Adam came along. And all of a sudden, uh, because he says death didn't happen until sin happened. And so you can't have evolution because there wasn't survival of the fittest because death didn't come until Adam sinned. And then he gets into the idea of uh, by Adam, the first Adam, the second Adam created by God was Jesus Christ on earth. And so he gets into all that and the whole doctrine of salvation is wrapped around creation. And so uh, we see that he made the pillars of the earth and she recognizes that. And uh, the pillars, the, the very foundations of the earth, as we see that uh, jo in the book of Job. Where were you when I created the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I did this? And uh, Job had to say, Lord, I wasn't here. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Sorry, I've, I've grumbled about you. And so we see that uh, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Now, that's poetic language. I don't know exactly. Is there something, oh, that's science. Uh, I'm not sure. Is the, pillar, the pearl, pillars of the earth. There's, in other words, the world, world is, no, this is poetic language. And so whatever the pillars of the earth are, the God hang, as we see in the book of Job, God hung the world on nothing. And so, what, so here she's saying, it's God who's the pillar of the earth. And so he set the pillars of the earth. And those, he will guard in safety. So here we have creation, safety, and he will guard the feet of his saints. There again, safety comes from the Lord. But the wicked will be silent in darkness. There again, the contrast that God says, yes, I will bless those who will follow me. And those who don't, of course, are going to, going to have their own problems. But he says, for by, for by strength, no man shall prevail. And so she's really pouring it on. Uh, 
without God, we're nothing. And she's saying that in so many different ways. But notice in verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. Now, in saying that, uh, well, I want you to turn with me over to Matthew. In Matt, excuse me, in Luke, Luke chapter 1. And we'll see Mary's Magnificat. And I've said many times that the influence of Mary's uh, or the psalm uh, or the song of Hannah's influences Mary's song so much. And we see that uh, as we go to verse 49, excuse me, let me get my glasses again. Sometimes with these new lenses, I'm having trouble. But uh, notice he says in verse um, uh, 49 of chapter 1 of, uh, of Luke, it says, for, you, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good thing and rich and the rich he has sent away empty. Now, does that sound like Hannah? Very much so. Um, uh, he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And so we see that she is using almost the same language or paraphrasing what Hannah has said. And so these women, they knew the Bible. And they, they would quote it even in their own, own songs. And so God greatly used these women. God didn't, make, God didn't make a mistake by the mothers that these men would have. Hannah, Mary, Elizabeth. We see that God greatly blessed them with, uh, and they were, you know, they were barren. And in Mary's case, there was a miraculous birth. But uh, so we see that uh, she exalts the Lord. He's, he's our creator. He's everything. He's all power. He's our safety. And then we see in these last verses something that's very significant. Because notice, there is no king in Israel at this time. Remember, there was no king in Israel. And every man was doing what was, his, what was right in his own eyes. But she remembered and she knew that God had promised that there would be a king. Because God had already told David, or excuse me, told Moses that, uh, that this book was to be read, the book of Deuteronomy, was to be uh, under the king's throne. And he was to read it regularly. And so there was no king yet. And yet she was looking forward by faith for the king of Israel to come. And so it wasn't there yet. It had been over, several, over 200 years, and God hasn't provided a king yet. He's still waiting. And, of course, we know that it was going to be David. God had in mind David, the tenth from Perez, was going to be the first king of Israel. Now, Hannah probably didn't have all that figured out, but God did. But, then she, was, but she was looking forward to that promise that God said, okay, we don't have a king, but God is going to supply one. Just like he supplied me a baby, God is going to supply us a king. And so she's a prophetess here, if you want to say that. But not only that, but that king, and exalt, that king also, he's going to exalt the horn. And again, Mary uses that term. Um, the strength of this king. And ultimately, the horn, the horn of his anointed. That word anointed is the word Messiah in the Hebrew. And the word Christ, Christos, in the, uh, the Greek is anointed. And here for the first time in the Bible, we see that the Messiah is predicted. And God does it through a woman. What a blessing it is to see that uh, here this godly woman was. God revealed to her a very special blessing. That the Messiah was coming and he was going to be the king. He was going to be a king. Now, she didn't have it all put together. There, had, there was no king yet. So this would be a muddle to her, just like a lot of the book of Revelation is a muddle to us because we know it's coming, but we don't know exactly how it's going to get here. And so she knew there was a king and she knew there was a Messiah. And just like Job back hundreds of years before her said, I know that my redeemer lives. He called him a redeemer. 
He's out there. We saw the book of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer, and the beautiful picture of him being predicted that he's coming. But now we see that the redeemer is called the Messiah, the anointed one. And what a blessing that is, that God, and it's another one of those things, uh, just one of those little nuggets in the Bible, where you see that God has his special blessings to those who are faithful to him, man or woman. And uh, how we see that God works here. And so we see that God gave strength to his king, and he exalted the horn of his anointed. Now, of course, the strength of his anointed would be, uh, we know, the all-powerful one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see that very touching last verse. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. Oh, what a blessing it is. God has done this. But can you imagine the heartstrings of that mother as now she turns that child over to the priesthood to be trained as a priest from child up? And we saw... Uh, that she would come, and I'm sure she probably came three times a year now, and every time she'd be bringing little coats to him. She'd be nurturing and praying for him, asking God to bless him, all those things. And, uh, and God greatly used him. In spite of the fact that he was surrounded by a couple of very ungodly uh, priests who were Eli's sons, God protected him, and God used him. God's good, isn't he? It isn't, to, you know, never underestimate the power of a praying mother or a praying woman or a praying child because we'll see that God even used a praying child named Samuel to bring revival to, America, to, <laughs> to Israel. And so God uses people, no matter what age, no matter what gender, God loves us and he will use us for his glory if we'll let him and if we really exalt him in our lives. Is he unique in your life? Does he, does he have first place in your life? In spite of your situation, your circumstances, is God supreme? I look at the world today. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We just had a president who says he's not going to run again. I don't know if he's going to resign tomorrow, whatever. But everybody's kind of in limbo. But there's a God in heaven. And he knows the end from the beginning. And he raises up one and cast down another. Uh, then we'll see what happens in the months to come. Very uncertain, but there's a God in heaven. And he will exalt who he wants, and he will bring down those he doesn't. But everything is in his hands. The heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. And we see that God will bless those who will bless him. Now, Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for Hannah. What a blessing it is to the Lord for the heritage that we have. Those great, tender, yet strong women. Those people who gave their hearts and lives to you. We thank you for our own mothers, Lord, who, who sacrificed. And yet, Lord, we pray now that you would raise up mothers again within Belvedere, within this country, that will bring their children up and pray for them in the nurture and the admonition of you, of the Lord. Bless, we pray now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.